<laughs> so anyway, God has been good, and I'm very happy. Well, anyway, we are, we're in Philippians chapter 3, verse 1. And this is coming to the, the letter of Philippians. It's kind of a pivotal time in this letter. Uh, let me just read this verse, chapter 3, verse 1. Uh, Paul, you know, just having finished uh, talking about the travel arrangements between with himself, first Timothy, himself, then Epaphroditus, um, which kind of sounds like he's kind of saying, okay, now here's when we're going to meet next time, how we're going to get together. And then he begins chapter 3, verse 1, Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. It is no trouble for me to write the same things to you again, and it is a safeguard for you. So, I mean, instantly, because of our the English translation, and the way you're, where you've just got done with you know some very serious writing in chapters 1 and 2, talking about travel plans, how are they going to see each other, and then finally, it sounds like, okay, he's coming in for a landing, and then he shoots off on chapter 3, verse 2, watch out for those dogs, those men who do evil, those mutilators of the flesh, for it is we who are the circumcision. He winds back up again and shoots off into another topic, or is he rehearsing something he's already written in this letter, something he's written in a previous letter, something he's already taught them, something Timothy and Epaphroditus has explained to them. Uh, he goes off on this again. Now, if you look in chapter 4, verse 8, you just look, it's the same exact word, same exact word. Yeah, chapter 4, verse 8, Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Um, and those, again, are our are, are commands or are in the imperative, just like we see in chapter 3, verse 1. Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. Rejoice in the Lord. That's an imperative. He's, he's telling them rejoice in the Lord. And then chapter 4, verse 8, finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever he's telling them what to think about. So now you've got a gap. Uh, some, now again, some would say. I'm, I'm just throwing this out there so you can see because Philippians had, I think we maybe mentioned it. I don't take it serious. It wasn't something we went into in detail because it's just, it's just a distraction. Some people think this is uh, the Philippians has got fragments that are put together, like there's maybe two letters here, and someone just put them together. And there's no reason for doing that. Why wouldn't you just have Philippians 1, Philippians 2? Why would you have to sew them together? But this, this is where some of them say uh, that chapter 3, verse 2 is the beginning of one of those letters or a fragment of one of the letters, and then someone just stuck it in here between chapter 3, verse 1, and chapter 4, verse 8, which means chapter 4, verse 8, should be chapter 3, verse 2. I mean, that's the way some would, and that, that, that I think, is not even worth considering, because there's, there's more reasons why that's ridiculous than it is to a serious thought. I mean, like, why would you cut off the, the beginning of the letter and the closing of the letter and just take out, you know, one chapter and stick it in here? Uh, there's no reference of Paul writing more than one letter to the Philippians. Never. Uh, there, there's just no reason for it. So, anyways, I just want to put that there and dismiss it so we can look for an answer. But you do see it, it's kind of awkward, it would appear. Uh, finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. It is no trouble for me to write the same things to you again, and it is a safeguard for you. So some of the key words, and you can see I've got the Greek there before we look back at. So the key words is finally... And, and how it's going to be interpreted. We'll look at a few things on that here in just, in just a moment. And then the, the, the word rejoice, which may be the hinge this whole verse is spinning around. I mean, this verse is talking about, Paul's talking about something, uh, and he's aiming at something, and maybe it's all hinged on the word rejoice. Uh, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. Then he says, it is no trouble for me to write the same things to you again, so he's talking about no trouble for him. It's not an inconvenience for him. Another way of saying it's it's not troublesome to write. And I'm just going to write the same thing. So now again, where does this the same things? Where where are they? I mean, is it a previous letter? Is it what he's already said? Is it something that he's taught? Same things again. In fact, he says, I'm going to say it again. It is a safeguard for you. That's the way the NIV translates it. Uh, I think if you look on the notes there, I've got it in there somewhere. S same thing. Uh, yes, literally. 
for you it is safe. So the safeguard is literally for you it is safe. So whatever he's doing, it's as always, Paul's interest is in the believers, how, how they're going to benefit, and he's concerned about them, and he's, he's, he's blocking off interference so that they can continue to grow, instructing them on, on the right way to go. And so that's, it's safe for them to hear it again, and he's saying, it's, it's my job. It's no trouble for me to, to write these again. And I hope to get over to Second Peter tonight, too, because Peter, in Second Peter uh, chapter 1, verse 12, he says something very similar. Meaning, basically, he says, I've got this message, and I'm going to keep repeating the message. It's not like I'm going to get something new. I mean, this is the message. So it's the same things. And so we're going to take a look at some of these here. So first of all, the word finally. Now you can see on, uh, well, let's just look there in the Greek. You can see the, uh, the, 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 the T-O, to, and loipon, which is the word finally, and then adelphoi. There it is, finally brothers or brothers of mine. And uh, like I say in the notes there, it looks, sounds like the closing of the letter, but it's interrupted, restarted 4.8, finally brothers. And again, remember, in 4.8, that is exactly the same Greek word. They're exactly the same. Oh, I do want to point this out too. I've got it in the notes here somewhere. But in my NIV, as I read the NIV, uh, the phrase, uh, it is no trouble for me to write the same things to you again. Uh, write the same things again. The word again is not in the Greek. That's a word the NIV just adds to help flow it out, make it flow better. Um, if you look at the notes that I've got, I've got the English Standard Version translation at the top. Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you is no trouble to me and is safe for you. So to write the same things, again, that... that that kind of leaves it a little more open when you say to write the same things to you again. Uh, it's kind of starting to limit your choices potentially. It's kind of adding more to it. So keep that in mind as we go through this. Um, I, next bullet point I write, most commentators believe that Paul is beginning to close his letter. And he, you know, most, most teachers say, well, it looks like he's closing the letter. Something happened. Um, and we have a Similar verse in 2 Corinthians. I'll just run over there. You can too. 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse, uh, verse 11. So here's just from Paul's writings. Here's the same thing, except it's clearly 2 Corinthians 13, the last chapter of 2 Corinthians. Uh, it's very clearly the end of the letter. In fact, he adds to it, finally, brothers, goodbye, is what it says in 2 Corinthians 13, 11. Finally, brothers, I'm reading 2 Corinthians 13, 11. Finally, brothers, goodbye. That's kind of like what we're expecting to hear in Philippians. Aim for perfection. Listen to my appeal. Be of one mind, which is interesting because that's a theme in Philippians. Be of one mind. Live in peace. And the God of love and peace will be with you. So there's that list, you know, kind of like a, some exhortations that we kind of have beginning in chapter 3, verse 1, picking up in chapter 4, verse 8. So he gets, you know, uh, aim for perfection, listen to my appeal, be of one mind, live in peace, and the God of love and peace will be with you. And so that's, there's room to think that this finally is Paul coming in for a landing on the letter, and then all of a sudden he doesn't feel like he's got a good landing or something happens, and he goes around for one more flight through the letter. That's, that's a decent thing. You've got to consider that. Um, but the fourth bullet point there on the notes, uh, to loipen, could be translated these ways. Uh, I've got written down, well then. Now these, are, these are like different commentators saying it could be translated this way. Well then. Or furthermore. Or to proceed then. Meaning, not, not finally, but now I'm going to go ahead and add to this or proceed another one towards the rest. Meaning now for the rest of the story. Almost. I mean, that, that's me adding, you know, paraphrasing it. But actually, one would be towards the rest. So instead of saying finally, it's almost like saying now for the next part or now for the, the, the final part. But there, there it is. Um, in this case, it would be a thought, uh, there would be no thought in Paul's mind of conclusion, but actually of a continuation. And that continuation may end up playing into same things. 
meaning finally or now to proceed with. Uh, and I'm going to tell you to you again, I'm going to go around. It's kind of like taking a flight from one city to another city. Now, this is a bad example. It just fell apart in my mind. But it's like you make the first flight, and then you go back and you do it again. It's probably a lot like what my son says to me uh, when I'm teaching. He says, Dad, you re you've heard me say this before, and you've heard me teach. He says, you, you said it, and then you said it again, and then you said it again. It's like we got it the first time. But, you know, and it's almost like that's what he's saying right here. It's no trouble for me, but he's meaning in his mind, he may have already said it, and now he's saying now, I'm going to say the same thing again. It's no trouble for me to write it again or say it again. And it's a safeguard for you. The reason I said it the first time was I wanted you to get it. Now I'm going to go back and I'm going to say it again because it's, it's important. That's why I'm writing this letter. So that would mean what he's going to talk about is something he's already addressed. Timothy and Ephroditus have already addressed it. He's already written a letter about it. Or is it in this letter? Is he going to repeat chapter 1 and 2 again from a different angle? Again, I'm not telling you anything yet. In fact, I'm not even saying, you know, that he's not saying, finally, goodbye, I'm closing down. Oh, wait, I've got to talk about this. And then in chapter 4, verse 8, he goes back to his closing. I mean, all these... And the reason I don't feel bad about saying, you know, this is what it means, is when, when commentators talk about it, they all talk about these things, and then, you know, they some drift this way, some drift that way. I'm going to drift up somewhere, you know, a certain direction, but... It's not like a slam dunk. It's like uh, someone even said, I've even heard someone teach this, that he's closing the letter, and then someone comes in and interrupts him and says, hey, uh, they're having trouble in Philippi with, with the, the Jewish legalizers. Or, the, you know, or, or Epaphroditus says, aren't you going to mention something about the, the, the Jewish you know, legalistic tendencies? They've got? Oh, yeah, I should probably say something about that again. So even it's almost, that's almost abrupt because it's like, you'd think that, you know, Epaphroditus has already mentioned these things and Paul's kind of flowing and not just jumping in and interrupting his own, you know, message. But some have presented it that way. So it's been presented, again, many ways, including that someone just stuck another letter in here. That this is not even the same letter. These verses are just from another letter someone just stuck in there. So you've got several options. I don't like the idea of another letter being stuck in. I've said that already. Okay. But... Um, the, the next thing I want to point out before we look further with that is the word rejoice in the Lord is the command here and it fits uh, well with 4 eight. like we said it's a continuation of some exhortations some um, imperatives and it's, a, it's an exhortation from Psalms such as Psalm 32 verse 11 we, I'm going to go through and read these very quickly Psalm 32 verse 11 because he is saying no matter how you slice or dice it Paul is saying finally or my next point, or now to continue, rejoice in the Lord. Rejoice in the Lord. And then he says, it, it's not hard for me to say the same thing because it's a safeguard. So we got to consider that rejoice in the Lord is the thing that Paul's repeating, and it's a safeguard for them to rejoice in the Lord. Why is it a safeguard for them to rejoice in the Lord? Maybe if they'll keep their eyes on the Lord, meaning no matter what the situation, if you're in prison or if you're in a, a church that there's contention and rivalry, if everyone will just back off and rejoice in the Lord, it's going to be a safeguard for you and you're going to be able to overcome these obstacles if it be prison or if it be certain Christians out there while Paul's in prison, some for false motives, some for pure motives. It's like it doesn't matter. Paul's going to rejoice in the Lord where, with where he's at, with what they're doing, and stay focused, and it's going to keep him safe instead of getting him off on some tangent of, of anger or bitterness or rivalry. So rejoicing could be a safeguard for him and for them, and he's already said something like that. But anyway, here's, here's a couple, chapter 32, verse 11 of, of Psalm, um, saying, uh, well, let's go verse 9. Now let's go to verse 8, please. Verse 8, Psalm 32, verse 8. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you and watch over you. Do not be like the horse or the mule, which have no understanding, but must be controlled by a bit or, and bridle, or they will not come to you. Meaning God is saying right here, I will instruct you, I will teach you, and you can just follow me. 
Don't be like an animal where I've got to put a bridle on you, otherwise you won't even listen. I've got to make you follow me. Many are the woes of the wicked, but the Lord's unfailing love surrounds the man who trusts in him. Rejoice in the Lord, here it is, and be glad, you righteous. Sing, all you who are upright in heart. So rejoice in the Lord and be glad, you righteous. There's that book. One. we got another uh, Psalm 33, verse 1, very next. Sing joyfully to the Lord, you righteous. It is fitting for the upright to praise Him. Praise the Lord with harps, make music to Him. Then it goes through the, uh, you've heard that Psalm many times. Psalm 43, Psalm 43, verse 4. Uh, talking about joy. Uh, I'm, I'm going to read through this, chapter 43. It's only five verses. Psalm 43. And we're looking at Psalm 43, verse 4. Vindicate me, O God, and plead my cause against an ungodly nation. Rescue me from deceitful and wicked men. You are God, my stronghold. Why have you rejected me? Why must I go about mourning, oppressed by the enemy? Send forth your light and your truth. Let them guide me. Let them bring me to your holy mountain, to the place where you dwell. Then will I go to the altar of God, to God my joy and my delight. I will praise you with the harp, O God, my God. Why are you downcast, O my soul? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. So as you go from verse 4 to verse 5, it's kind of like Paul's situation if it's himself in prison, if it's the Philippians in their situation. Remember, suffering has been a theme. Paul's suffering. The Philippians are suffering. Uh, Christ's suffering. He's saying we're going to follow Christ's example. And so why are you downcast, O my soul? Why so disturbed? Put your hope in God or rejoice in God, and these other things will fade to, you know, fade away. and They won't be as important because your strength is in the Lord. So again, he may be simply saying... I'm going to repeat myself, rejoice in the Lord, and it's safe safeguard for you. Just like David, David seemed to have some troubles in a couple of those psalms, especially that last one, where he's got uh, wicked people, uh, he's got oppression coming against him, God's not showing up, things aren't working out, he looks guilty, looks like he's in trouble, but he's going to stay focused on God, he's going to rejoice and give God room to work. So. He may be saying something like that. That's another way of looking. Finally, my brother, I'm in chapter, Philippians chapter 3, verse 1. Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. No matter any of our situations, if it be Paul's or the Philippians, rejoice in the Lord. And it's no trouble, he says, for me to write the same thing, and it is a safeguard for you. It's important that we stay focused on rejoicing in the Lord. So there, there that could be simply what it means. Um, and then he would con con continue with... Uh, the, the closing of the exhortations in chapter 4, verse 8. Um, now, I want to look at this, the last bullet point. Um, what are the same things Paul has written before and is now writing again? And if you go to, uh, there's three bullet points there. What are the same things? Um, the same things could, if we go with rejoice, you can see in Philippians 2.18, uh, I'm looking for 218. Uh, as, he, as he finishes uh, talking about, after talking about Christ and having the mind of Christ and, and telling them to live in, a, in the world as lights shining, in chapter 2 of Philippians, verse, uh, verse 18, he says, So you too should be glad and rejoice with me. So the last thing he says before he goes off on the travel plans is rejoice. Then he gives the travel plans, then he comes back and says, finally, brothers, rejoice, Lord. And I'm saying the same thing. So maybe that's the maybe that's the repeat. Maybe he's repeating verse 18. So you should be glad and rejoice with me. I'm in a tough situation, but I'm rejoicing and I'm glad. You too should be the same way. Now these guys are going to come visit you. And now it's no trouble for me to tell you again where I left off. You need to rejoice again. And we can see other places, 125 and 228, 29, where he mentions the, the rejoicing. Um, again, the, the second bullet point, joy might be that safeguard keeps you from the critical thinking. And Paul is introducing his warning that begins in 3.2. That is something that he's uh, already warned them about. So what I've got written down in those three little bullet points is three ways of considering the same thing. The same thing could be what he's already written in chapter 2, verse 18. 
the same thing might be the, the concept that joy is what's going to be the safeguard. Um, but now, let's start looking at what follows. Uh, beginning in chapter 3, verse 2, he spins off on another whole, it seems like another whole direction. I'm going to read that to you now. But what comes in beginning in chapter 3, verse 2, going up to chapter 4, 7, uh, one, that may be a teaching against legalism. I'll just write anti-legalism. That he's already preached the Philippians. Uh, so that, it may, that may be the message. Or, if you look at this, what's going to be written here is Christ-centered. And it may be a repeat of chapters 1 and 2. Yeah, let's look at this first. Um, oh, I, I, yeah, let, I'll come back to this here in, in just a minute. Let's look at this and see what's in these verses that's coming up in chapter 3, verse 2. And, and what you're going to hear, and you know these verses. It's not like, you know, the first time you've ever heard these. But what he's going to do is he's going to attack legalism, Jewish legalism, He's going to then use his own personal testimony that he was once legalistic, but he's going to very quickly, this, this is going to get us right here, he's going to very quickly, his own personal testimony is going to be Christ. Christ is living in him. I used to be legalistic, try to uh, tribe of Benjamin, you know, seed of Abraham, everybody, but now I'm alive in Christ. So it's Christ centered. Um, then there's going to be talking about uh, sufferings. It's coming, that's going to be a, I'll point that out. I'll just write A here, B here. Another thing that's going to be mentioned here is suffering. If, if you're going to be Christ-centered, you're going to suffer because Christ suffered. If you're going to be legalistic, you're going to be self-centered. I've done all these things. And Paul's going to describe himself that way. You're going to be self-centered sufficient, self-centered, and people are going to be stinking impressed. And there's going to be no suffering. There's going to be no persecution. You're going to be honored. There's going to be honor because you're not presenting Christ. You're presenting yourself as the great man, and everybody wants to be around the great man. And see the contrast. Christ, self, suffering, honored. And then what comes up next here in this is going to be... Um, beginning in verse 12, not that I've already obtained all this, but I press on, take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. We end up talking about eschatology or the eschatological value of this, meaning you're not going to be rewarded here in life. You're going to suffer here in life. But you are going to be rewarded. These people are going to be honored in life, but when it comes to being honored by Christ, it's going to be like don't need this. Christ is going to be like uh, no. And now, if you, if you can remember, this is chapter 1 and 2. It, we've, we talked about Christ-centered, suffering, and then eventually being rewarded at the end. That's what chapter 1. So, when he says, write the same thing to you again, I, I got ahead of myself here. When we read this, he may be just coming at them with anti-legalism. and say, I've already told you, you don't need to be impressed by the Jews. But when you get into what he writes, and he does come against Jewish legalism, but when he, when he starts talking about that, it's really not, this is not a new topic, it's the same topic written from, again, another position. So let's read this. In other words, what we saw in chapters 1 and 2, you almost see them again right here, potentially. But let's read it and, and you decide. You're looking for these, two things I told you to look for. One is Someone's run in and tells him something, or he's remembered, or Epaphroditus says, you haven't said anything about the Jews. And he goes, oh, yeah, i got to tell you, watch out for those guys, because they're going to try to impress you with their works of the flesh. And I've already done that. I've been a tribe of Benjamin. I've been a Pharisee of Pharisees. And I've found my fulfillment in Christ. It's not this. And in the end, it's all going to matter how you were with Christ, not your legalistic standard. So are we looking, is he just also went anti-Jewish legalism? Or when he says the same thing, this is just repeating the same thing he said in chapters 1 and 2, but from another place. Here we go. Chapter 3, verse 2. What he's writing is the same thing, and it's a safeguard for them. Watch out for those dogs. 
those men who do evil, those mutilators of the flesh. For it is we who are the circumcision, we who worship by the Spirit of God, who glory in Christ Jesus, and who put no confidence in the flesh. So I myself have reason for such confidence. If anyone else, now this, his, this is his personal testimony. He warns them, and now he says, listen, I know, because I was one of those guys, and if anyone's going to boast, it's me. Now, do, do take this in mind. You should remember this right here. If, if you're Christ-centered, as Paul is, you're, you're going to have to suffer in this age. Now, again, remember, Peter writes, if we do good, who's going to want to harm you if you do good? If you're out serving and doing good things, people are going to want to support that. But if your life is Christ-centered, the world is not going to understand that. If it's self-centered and you're working for honors and recognitions, uh, the world's going to honor that. Listen, Paul's going to describe himself. When Paul was the Pharisee, this was him. And he was honored, for example, the high priest gave him letters. He was on the Inquisition team. I mean, he was front and center. He didn't stone Stephen. He guarded the coats because he was kind of overseeing the Avengers Lamb right here, and you guys take care of business. He was overseeing the, uh, the, 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 the uh, what do you call it, the, the firing squad. I mean, he was the boss under the high priest because this was him. He finds Christ. Now where is he? The same people who are honoring him, he's in prison in Rome. So Paul knows what he's talking about. When he was honoring himself, he was honored by men. When he was living for Christ, he was suffering. This is going to be a dead end. This is going to be rewarded. So that's what he, he there's, you know, this he knows what he's talking about. Watch out for those dogs. They're the other ones who mutilate the flesh. If anyone else thinks he has reason to put confidence in the flesh up here, I have more. In other words, if you want to get competitive and stack up honors, you know, let's go. I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day. So he begins at the beginning of his life. Circumcised, and we'll go through this later. Circumcised on the eighth day of uh, uh, eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law, a Pharisee. As for zeal, persecuting the church. As for legalistic righteousness, faultless. Now that's legalistic righteousness, faultless. He was able to say, I'm faultless. If it has to do with a legalistic ritual, I didn't miss a beat. I, I got it right every time. But whatever was to my profit, I now consider lost for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. And we, we hear this in chapters 1 and 2, the idea of being united with Christ. For whose sake I've lost all things, I consider them rubbish. What people honor, Paul says, I consider this rubbish. I, I, it doesn't even... It's not like I'm resisting that, I'm resisting that, I just, I'm trying not to go there. Like, he says it's like being tempted by a garbage truck. It's like, there's nothing there. He says, for, who, uh, for whose sake I have lost all things, I consider them rubbish, that I may gain Christ and be found in Him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ. I just want you to stop, and, and I know this is so... We know this. Righteousness through faith in Christ. And I, we, we know that. But Paul is, is, I mean, he's making the contrast. This is all the standards, and this is now faith in Christ. Now, that faith in Christ is going to make you righteous. It's also going to empower you to grow. And he's going to talk about, now, I, I use the term growing, maturing. And I try to make sure I keep this right. Growing and maturing does not mean running over here and becoming more legalistic. Growing and maturing, it, it, this has not, it's like you're not even looking this direction. You're looking more where? Well, I'm looking for some standards to be more Christ-like. Okay, well now you've replaced all these, this list with the list over here. There's nowhere in here is a list. He's wanting to know Christ. It's a person. You understand what I'm trying to say right there? Because in the way I teach it, sometimes I, I, I find myself slipping into, well, I don't want to be legalistic, but now that we're saved, we're righteous in Christ, 
I want to grow. And what does growth indicate? It would look like me being more Christ-like. So, what is Christ-like? Well, Christ is boom, 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 boom. And now I start shooting at these targets, which become a what? It's another list of targets. And it's like, have you met Christ? Well, yeah, I, this is, these are the attributes of Christ. Well, do you know him? I mean, it's like... Don't, don't, if you just meet Christ, if you spend time with Christ, if you get in, get into who He is, it almost sounds too mystical now. These things are going to become your nature. So as Paul's writing this, he's not taught. He's not both lists, the legalistic list per se, and the list of what would be Christ-like, are going to have similar characteristics on them. But he's talking about. He's pushing it further of, of knowing Christ. Well, let me read this again. For whose sake I've lost all things, I consider them rubbish that I may gain Christ and be found in Him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God and is by faith. I want to know, know Christ. Notice what he said. I want to know Christ. Says, I want to become more like Christ. I mean, I'm not saying that's bad, obviously, but that's not the target. Your target is I want to become more like Christ. No, you mean you want to know Christ. Because when you know Christ, that power that resurrected you spiritually is going to resurrect your soul. You're going to become more Christ-like in your behavior because you know, who knows what Paul says? I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection. And again, what, what does that power of resurrection mean? That doesn't just mean resurrection at the end of time, per se. That would refer to resurrection even in your life from being a dead works person. You're now, you're, li you're, you're back to life. Christ is now producing in you. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in his suffering, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow to attain to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained all this or have already been made perfect, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me Brothers, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. All of us who are mature should take such view of things, and if on some point you think differently, that too God will make clear to you. Only let us live up to what we have already attained. That would kind of match what we were talking about in church on Sunday. Live up to what we've already attained, meaning... If this is the if picking dandelions as as flowers for your grandma is the best you can do, well then grandma's going to be happy. But you can you can go beyond that. I mean, as as you gain understanding, uh, if you remember what we were talking about. <clears throat> All of us who are mature should take a view of such things. And if on some point you think differently, that too God will make clear to you. Only let us live up to what we have already attained. Join with others in following my example, brothers, and take note of those who live according to the pattern we gave you. Again, he give, he's talking about Timothy and Epaphroditus being as examples. For as I have often told you before, now say again, even with tears, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction, their God is their stomach, and their glory is in their shame. Their mind is on, is on earthly things, but our citizenship is in heaven. And we eagerly wait, await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under control will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. Therefore, my brothers, you whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, that is how you should stand firm in the Lord, dear friends. And now, exhortation here again with uh, Euodia and Syntyche. Uh, he's, he talks about those again, and then he goes into verse 8, and we go back to the, the finally, and he gives some exhortations there. Okay, now... If, if you're looking at him just coming against the legalists, which is fine, because they may have, they have infiltrated them, the Philippians potentially, and there may be some tendency to, you saw what happened at the Galatian church, people were actually going over to the Jewish side, as far as legalism, abandoning Christ. That may be what is happening here. Uh, but I'm going to suggest that when he talks about, you know, finally, and it's the same thing. He's actually repeating himself from what we saw at the beginning. So I'm going to do this just as a suggestion that what we're looking at here in chapter 3, verse 2, 
Um, let me do this quickly, see if I can do this very quickly. That was good though, if it was <laughs> hanging together. Uh, what I was trying to do was show you the section of, and you, if I would slow down and read through, we could, we, I know you could, we could do it right here, is those three areas that I, I identified of being united with Christ. He already has talked about that, and then talking about the suffering, that's in chapter one, the suffering. And then, of course, the end times, the rewards, or the eschatology. And so the ideal here is being unified with Christ. He's already talked about being unified with Christ and encouraging them. And then that's going to result in suffering, and he talks about suffering, and then the rewards. So the same three levels of being united with Christ, that's going to result in suffering. Get ready. That's, you, if, you, if you proceed with Christ, it's going to result in suffering in the world. And then there will be the reward, the eschatological reward. And he's already talked about it. And what I guess what I'm saying is I like the idea, all the things that we presented on what is this chapter 3, verse 1 aiming towards. Finally, is he getting interrupted? And he's, you know, uh, and he's, oh, I forgot to talk about the legalistic Jews. Or has someone inserted a, another letter, which is, is ridiculous. Uh, is he talking about rejoicing? Is he repeating his command and advice to rejoice? Could be. Uh, or is he repeating himself that this is his model right here? Chapters 1 and 2 was union with Christ. You're going to have to suffer. Get ready for it. Because Christ suffered, we will suffer. But there's going to be a reward. And now, and again, the finally doesn't necessarily mean finally now it's the end of my letter. Oh, i got to write something else. As in, I'm going to say this again. Our next, I'm going to continue. We saw some of those definitions there. Towards the rest. What else have I got to say? Now here's here's this. Like we said, the, the word finally, towards the rest. So what else have you got to say? What else have I got to say? <laughs> uh, the same thing. Uh, it's no trouble for me, but I've only got one thing. You need to be united with Christ. Your life is going to be suffering as far as growing in Christ, be learning to know who Christ is, and you're going to you're the more you get closer to Christ, the more it's going to result in suffering, and there will be a reward. So Chapters 1 and 2, this is it. Now, what else we got to say? Chapter 3 and 4, it's the same thing. The same pattern is followed. Now, with that being said, I'm going to finish with this and go to 2 Peter, uh, chapter 1. And I think this is important uh, even as we... Because this was Paul's, what Paul was presenting. Many times you see him presenting the same model. And I think we just potentially... None of the other options are wrong, because I don't think we really know. But I like the idea that what is happening in Philippians is he's presenting his model in chapters 1 and 2, and then comes back and presents it again in chapter 3 as far as union with Christ, the suffering, and then the eschatological rewards. And sometimes I think, uh, I, I, mean, I know this, I know, I know, I know this that sometimes people feel pressure, uh, like pastors or speakers, of, of lighting it up, you know, and how are we going to, you know, what are we going to, you know, give the people, uh, how are we going to, or, I, I've got a great advantage, I think, because I've, I've kind of just committed to teaching the Word of God. I mean, we're in, what, 54 message in Romans. So, I mean, if you're still there, when we get done that, we'll go back through Jeremiah or Isaiah. I mean, it takes years, to, you know, to go through these things. And, of course, you go through and you, you, re, you repeat certain things. But I, I'm never under pressure because I'm teaching the Bible. I guess it's, maybe it's a cop-out. Maybe it's, a, you know, a divine calling. I don't know. Um, but you can see these, these apostles, they had a message. They had... Uh, and again, the message is not like small. If if you limit it, if you go off on a tangent and you limit it, like uh, again, I don't mean this in a derogatory sense, but the salvation message, you know, come to Christ and you will be saved. And that's the only thing you've got you're working with is the you know, and then you're gonna like, oh, what else can we do? Well, have you know, get people saved again? And it's like week after week, you're just this is it. Or if you go down the charismatic group, you're going to have, you know, this little target here of, you know, whatever. they they got like a 12-message circle they go through. 
and they just repeat these things. Uh, some churches are fortunate because they've got they've got some kind of liturgy, and they've got all the day all the Sundays of the year marked. They've got scripture readings set aside for each one. There's you know Lent, and then there's e e Epiphanies, and then there's Pentecost, and there's all these these days. You guys ever been in a, a denominational church? And every Sunday is a special day. And basically, you get this Sunday is what you talk about, you know, this topic. And this Sunday, every it just it's a calendar. Y'all, you get them in the mail. You just they just mail you your message basically. And and that's kind of nice. And then you don't have to really do much. Uh, my whole point: Peter and Paul and, and others, they knew there's a message, and if you don't stick to the messages, you're going to want to get distracted and go off off record. Look at this right here, chapter two or chapter one of Second Peter. Um, I'm going to begin in verse five, so I can read into it. Uh, he's giving advice to the you know is this, he's in prison. I think Peter's in prison at this time, and we don't know for sure, but it. He's talking about dying, and it's you know, the way it's written. Uh, the style of Greek we've studied is different than First Peter because First Peter was edited or written by Mark for Peter. Peter may be writing this by himself. This is written more you know rougher. It doesn't match the the verbs and tenses don't always match because it's written by a fisherman instead of a scribe. So this, he's probably you know 64 A.D. Uh, at, at the end of his life. So he writes this, in verse 5, For this reason make every effort to add to your faith goodness, and to goodness knowledge, and to knowledge self-control, and to self-control perseverance, and to perseverance godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness love. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. So notice again, you've got knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, and that will be effective and productive if you continue to grow. But if anyone does not have them, he is nearsighted and blind and has forgotten that he has been cleansed from his past sins. So people can hear these things or know these things, forget them, and then drift off and go down another trail. Still call themselves Christians. Therefore, my brothers, be all the more eager to make your calling and election sure, for if you do these things, you will never fail and you will receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. There it is. Now, verse 12. So, I mean, that, that's basically his message. What you've seen right there, that is, that's, his, that's his talking points. Verse 12. So, I will always remind you of these things, even though you know them and are firmly established in the truth you now have. I think it is right to refresh your memory as long as I live in the tent of this body. And I'll read more of that in just a moment. But you understand, you hear what he's saying? It's like, here's, here's his, his talking points. These, these points right here. This one, this one, this one. And he says, there it is. Now, I'm going to remind, I know you're established in it. I know you've heard it. I've told it before. But I'm going to keep reminding you because this is the focus. These are the things we're looking at. Uh, now I read on verse 14 because he says, I, 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 as long as I live in the tent of this body, I'm going to continue to remind you of these things. I, I, that's what's nice about this. It's like, what, what, is, what are you going to do? As long as, for example, I'm here, this is what I'm going to teach. And I don't know why, I don't know why, I, I, I don't, I, again, there's, there's a thousand things, but why, why not just teach this verse by verse, word by word, just keep going through it. It's like, what else do you have? As a pastor, what, what else would you bring to the people of God? Jesus told Peter, feed my sheep. And this is the word of Christ. This is what makes you grow. They tell you, I wrote the book, uh, the apparatus book. It, it, this is the word that got you saved. This is the word that renews your mind. This is the word that when it becomes effective, it's going to produce results in your life that will result in eternal rewards. Well, yeah, but we want a, a seminar on, and then you name a topic, you know. And, and, and you're over here talking about worldly things. Why are people not just, really, why are people not just teaching this? I, I've said this before. I believe churches should be teaching this. If you call yourself a church of Jesus Christ, why are you not teaching this every night of the week? Now, you don't have to burn yourself out. You can have several people doing it. 
But why is not the church? Well, people won't come. <laughs> it's like, so that's the standard. People won't come, so if they won't come, we're not. It's like, well, then our standard is what will make people come? It's like, this should be taught. If you're a church and you've got your electric bill paid and your doors are open, you've got someone that will teach this, why don't you turn the lights on, unlock the door, and let them teach this in the church Monday night, Tuesday night, Wednesday night, every night? And if one person shows up, they get taught. I mean, you've got a pastoral staff. I mean, one, two, seven, twenty. And, well, there's, why aren't you teaching this word? But well, we've got a seminar coming up. We've got this topic. This week's theme, or this month's theme is, it's like, is anybody doing this? Peter and Paul, we just saw in, 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 in Philippians, Paul says, it's no trouble for me to say the same thing to you. I already said it. I'm going to say Now, whatever he's talking, I think he's talking about his three bullet points in chapters 1 and 2. He's repeating them in a different form, saying the same thing, making another application. But whatever he's saying, he's repeating it. If it's, it's, if it's message on rejoice, if it's a message against legalism, whatever he's saying, you know, and I think we've got several choices if we try to discern, discern what he's saying. He's saying, I'm going to keep saying it. I'm not going to give you something new. And Peter here again, he says, as long as I remain in this body, I think it is right to refresh your memory because I know that I will soon put it aside as the Lord Jesus Christ has been clear to me and I'll make every effort to see, watch this, verse 15, and I'll make every effort to see that after my departure, after he is dead, you will always be able to remember these things. Now what is he doing? Is he going to have a open a, uh, create a website with all of his teaching on it? Well, what's he going to create a library or the Peter Memorial? He's in prison, about to die. What is he doing that to make every effort to see that after my departure, you'll always be able to remember these things? I mean, has he got people going out like Mark and others that were with him that were sharing the message? Is he recording it? What, what is he doing? But he knows this is the message. And i got to read this if you don't mind. Because, and I'll, I'll have to quit because I'm, I'm I'm done with what I'm saying, but look at this. This fits so well. He says, we did not follow cleverly invented stories when you, we told you about the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. Now, what he's talking about here is, I'm telling you the truth. We saw the transfiguration. He's talking about the transfiguration. He, he said, we're not following cleverly invented stories. In other words, there are people that are, are coming up with stories and, and myths and legends and trying to woo the crowd. He said, we're not telling you. This is exactly what happened. For he received honor and glory from God the Father when the voice came to him from the majestic glory saying, this is my son whom I love, with him I'm well pleased. We're clearly talking about the transfiguration. We ourselves heard this voice and came that came from heaven when we were with him on the sacred mountain. We... And we have the word of the prophets made more certain. And you'll do well to pay attention to it as the light. Okay, you ready? Right here's the switch. He says, we did not, we did not create a story. And, and uh, the, that word story, if I remember right, it, it has to do with myth. It's a Greek word, myth. It's not a legend. It's not a story. It wasn't something to bring the crowd in. Tonight, Peter will be talking about his experience with Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. He says, this was not a myth. That was that story was the fact. It was a fact from my life. I saw it. We heard the voice of God. We were there. Now watch this. If, if, he would, if Peter were alive today and he could set up a traveling tour, I mean, he could, he would just, he could just travel the world and tell stories about his experience with you. Well, you know, when Jesus, you know... Uh, when my net started to tear, this is what made me feel. I felt, and they'll tell us more, and they, they'd love to interview. Well, watch this. This is what he says. Verse 18. Watch the switch. We ourselves heard this voice that came from heaven when we were with him on the sacred mount. And we have the word of the prophets made more certain. He says, some people want to hear this story. He says, no. He says, we've got something more certain. The word of the prophets, I'll just write the word Bible. Word of the prophets, that's the Old Testament. We have the word of the prophets made more certain. And you will do well to pay attention to it. Not to the stories, but to the scriptures. You'll do well to pay attention to it as to a light shining in a dark place. Now, where is that dark place? Potentially, 
It's it's your heart. It's it's you have your your unrenewed. Your mind is unrenewed. You think like the world, and so these cool stories are are, are more fun to hear. These life application skills are more fun to hear. But you will do well to pay attention because when this light starts shining in your heart, you're not going to want to go to it's all the seminars and hear all the fun stuff. You'll be right here. Light shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Above all, you must... Now, what are we talking about here? We're talking about Scripture. Why? How do you know? Watch. Above all, one of the greatest verses in the text of Scripture about Scripture is coming up. Above all, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation. There's nothing in the Scriptures that is just what the prophet thought about the story. There's nothing in here, but this is what Jeremiah felt. This is what Noah thought happened. This is, this is, no, it was, none of it is personal opinion. All of it, it came not by the prophet's own interpretation. For prophecy, never, and again, when we say prophecy here, we're not talking about prophesying or a prophet like Daniel talking about the end times. We're talking about speaking and recording the word of God, the written word, the logos in written form. For prophecy never had its origin in the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Now you tell me, do you want to hear stories? Or do you want to hear what God has spoken through his, through his prophets by the Holy Spirit, carrying them along so that it could be recorded, so you could have the light shining in the dark? Well, no one's going to come to Bible study, so we're, not going, to, we're going to cancel Bible study. But we are going to have a seminar on some self-help guru type thing. Oh yeah, and we're going to advertise everybody will come. We'll call it a seeker activity. Well, Peter and Paul uh, were not going down that road because they understood the power of the message. Paul calls it knowing Christ. Peter's calling it here uh, the word of life, the, the, the scriptures, the word of the prophets made more clear. And this was the message that they, he says, and when I'm done, he says, I'll tell it to you again. Both Paul and Peter Peter says, as long as I remain in the body, I'm going to keep... You already... Notice, he says, you already know this. You're already established in it. But I'm going to remind you. Now imagine, what he is saying is, if you have this, I already know this. I'm already established in this. So what do I do now? Can I now go to a seminar? No. We're going to now remind you of it so you don't forget it. Now I can tell you, nobody in the Western church knows this and is well established in it that they go, got it. And if they were, you know what the word says right here? Well, you need someone to teach it to you so you don't forget it. It's got to be daily. It's the bread of life. Every day you got to be hearing it. Anyway, anyway, you would see Paul right there saying, similar to what Peter was saying right there, I'm going to say the same thing and it is no trouble for me. It's no skin off my nose. If, in fact, he says, basically, it's, it's his job. And if he came up with new inventions, that's what he was having trouble with the Corinthian church because they had some new teachers come in and say, oh, we got some new information. They're always warning against new stuff. But anyway, we'll pick up now next week, chapter 3, and that should be uh, an interesting because, one, we're going to go into legalism. We're going to talk about the Jewish code. Then we're going to have Paul's personal testimony about where he was at. And then we're going to get right back into Christ. And again, I don't want to use that word mystic in a bad sense. But it's going to be Christ of knowing Christ, not finding out the ten rules that Christ wants you to do. It's the power. This is scary stuff, for, especially for me, a Bible teacher. Because guess who wants a list? You know who wants a list? The Bible teacher wants, these are the ten things we're going to cover. You do these ten things, I can give you an A on your Christian exam. But it's like, that's not the message. The message is, you have to know Christ. Well, uh, I personally have never like walked up to him. I can't even introduce you to him. The only thing I can do is, is give you his word, uh, tell you what's in the scriptures. But somehow, through that word coming into your mind, you have a mystical relationship with Christ. That's how you got saved. That's how you're going to grow. And the closest I can come to introducing you to Christ, when Paul says, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection, where, where are you going to go? The, as far as I, maybe it's just my, my, my gift or my position, my understanding. The closest you can come is the word of God. Now again, you can 
pray, you can have mystical experiences, you can see God, you can fast, you all, whatever you want to try. But at the end of the day, Peter and Paul are talking about hearing, and, and all, through Jeremiah, the prophets, David, hearing the word that's going to transform your life. Some, well, John, in the beginning, the word was with God, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. It's, how are you going to be Christ? It's going to be through his word. So, uh, we'll pick that up uh, next next week. I do appreciate you being here. I hope that was helpful, insightful. Again, the challenging thing for me, again, is this, this mystery where Paul's going. He's already been there. He's going to go there again. Talk about this, of knowing Christ, this union with Christ. And if you're unified with Christ, it's going to result in rejection here in this world um, at some level. So, I'll pray and... Uh, you're free to go. Father, we do thank you again for the chance to look into your word. We ask that we may take it serious and allow it to change our lives. We do thank you for bringing us into Christ and ask that we, through the word, through your spirit, through however you want to communicate to us, that we can continue to grow and become more Christ-like in our own lives, in our own activities, that we may know Christ as, as Paul uh, said he desired to know Christ. Again, we thank you for this opportunity. We thank you for the freedom we have in this country and ask that we would not squander. We take every opportunity we have to share the word of God. Uh, that we may bring this word to this generation. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you again for your time.